lady. Thank you. <laughs> and also, by the way, this will be recorded. Uh, tonight, to allow our panelists time to present the valuable information, please place your questions in the chat. We'll have extensive time for discussion and interaction next month. And with that, I have the honor of, uh, with this team that we have assembled the panelists introducing, and if you guys can raise your hand, first of all, Kelly Beer, who is a registered nurse. Kelly is the clinical research manager for the Myositis Discovery Program in Perth, Australia at Murdoch University. And those of you may have been around last year or the year before, you will have seen Kelly coming and speaking with us about research and the research that they were doing in Perth. We also have Allison Fisher. Allison is an occupational therapist with the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. Um, some of you over the past few months may have seen or heard Allison with Ruben and Finn in our fall prevention programs. And uh, new to the women with IBM, but definitely not new to myositis, is Megan McGowan. Megan is the rehab clinical coordinator at Johns Hopkins Myositis Center. And um, Megan, as I have known, was one of the first people I saw as a patient with IBM um, as an as an occupational therapist, but that now being promoted and working in a more administrative, working with more mental health and in a uh, higher capacity. So with that, um, I am going to turn it over to Megan, and, oh wait a minute, yes, to Megan and Allison first to talk about self-concept and IBM. Thank you, Nancy. Um, one, that was such a generous introduction and we may be using Nancy as an example for a lot of our resiliency <laughs> talk, so. Um, first, I, I guess I wanna start with a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, for example, I work in mental health. Uh, however, um, no, in no capacity will we be able to answer all questions and fix all problems and, and have the answers for everything. But our goal of um, talking to y'all today is to inspire some self-reflection, um, maybe put words to some of the feelings you might be experiencing um, and to, give you some food for thought that maybe you could bring back to your support system or your therapist to really work through. Um, so thank you for having us. And I guess, yeah, let's jump into it. The first concept we're going to talk about is self-concept. And I suppose the best way to think about this is it's your definition of yourself. And if you were a definition, what would it say if you looked yourself up in the dictionary? Um, it's how we define ourselves kind of physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually. And I'll be honest, most of us don't sit down and think about and, and write down our definition of who we are. Um, and sometimes when we think about that question, who am I, it can be really daunting. And, and you may not even be able to put it to words because sometimes who we are is like a feeling or a behavior or an emotion that washes over us. Um, for example, when I was asked that question once, I said, I guess who I am is when I see someone sitting alone at dinner, I am overwhelmed with wanting to sit with them. You know, like that's not really, that's the best way I can define who I am. Um, 
it's it's kind of a nice self-reflection opportunity to think about who you are because it's really important because it defines and impacts our motivations, our attitudes, our behaviors. For example, who I am, I'm a six foot tall, goofy therapist, right? So my behavior is I don't choose to wear high heels because I would either hit the ceiling or hit the floor when I trip. So my definition of myself really impacts my behaviors. Um, and I, I get into this because if our definition of ourselves is more on the negative side, it's going to affect what behaviors um, and, and what attitude and motivations we have. And, and we'll kind of talk about this in, in a little bit. Um, there's kind of this concept. Well, first, when I was doing research in self-concept, and I've actually been to a few courses on it, I mean, it's it's so deeply researched on what goes into it. It's a really complicated concept that I'm trying to just kind of make kind of generalized, easy surface level stuff just to get started thinking about it. Um, but there's this concept of ideal self versus self-image. And, and I brought this up because of my experience with, with IBM um, and, and some of you might experience this. Ideal self is our perceived um, definition where we are our, our best person. This might be um, beyond what we physically can do, emotionally we can handle, but this is what we define as ideal. And and you can kind of throw in that word perfect, like this is what we I, I, uh, um, see ourselves in as perfect. Whereas self-image is how we actually view ourselves currently. And, and sometimes, and often, oftentimes, there's a disconnect of what our ideal perception is and what our perception is now. Um, and I bring this concept up as an opportunity to provide a little self-reflection for you all. Um, take a second and kind of think about what is your definition of your ideal self? And what is your definition of your current self-image? Is it similar? Is it different? Is it very different? Does it cause you to feel uncomfortable? Does it cause you to feel down and deflated? Um, it, I, I just kind of want you to kind of think about how, how you're viewing yourself. When it comes to self-concept, um, the research shows that it varies widely. Uh, amongst people, very often it's not based in reality, believe it or not. They did a study and when people kind of defined their own self-image, um, it did not match objective measures that were done of them. So we often are harder on ourselves. Um, and it also, our self-image can vary based off of kind of our immediate context. So if we're in a a doctor's visit that's not going so well, or we got in bad news, our self-image is going to be entirely different than maybe spending some time with family on vacation. Um, so self-image can vary um, from very positive to very negative. And I bring all this up because if you've ever kind of toiled with this um, difficulty with defining yourself or feeling really down about yourself, recognize that it's very common. And when you look at this concept within the world of chronic illness, it's even more so. Um, and I'm gonna kind of pass it to um, Allison to talk about how self-concept can, you know, be really changed when you've been diagnosed with IBM. So a lot of times I see with my IBM patients, it is a very physical, kind of disease that affects like a lot of physical function and things like that, which when you look up at that first bullet point, that physical is a big piece that goes into your self-concept. But I think another important thing to remember is you have many other factors that go into the self-concept. So while physical traits may change a little bit, it's good to kind of remember who you are in terms of your emotions? Are you someone who is compassionate towards others? Um, are you someone who likes to laugh with others a lot? Are you someone that has a lot of deep um, 
like morals and values that really like define who you are. Um, because like Megan said, self-concept is going to be kind of a fluid thing. It's going to kind of change. Um, it changes for everyone over the lifespan, but certainly a chronic illness can kind of affect how you're going to view yourself. But taking the time to recognize this part of me is different, but these things are still the same. This is still how I see myself. It might be slightly different than it was before, but how do we kind of come to see I can still be me no matter how I am identifying myself at this point in my life? Mm -hmm. And another thing to think about is a diagnosis of IBM is a part of your story. And so how do you put that in your definition? Um, it can be used as a tool of resiliency. Um, it can be used as a tool of strength. It can also be used in the opposite capacity. It can be used as a tool of sadness, of um, jealousy. So really think about and again, I don't have the answers because self-concept is so individualized. So this is meant to be kind of a self-reflective. How do you define yourself and how do you put IBM in your definition? Because it is part of your defined person. I say I'm six feet tall. I know that's you know not a diagnosis, but that's something I can't change. It's happened to me. It's part of my defined self. And I use it a lot. You'll hear it a lot tonight. Sorry, <laughs> y'all. But um. But how do you use IBM in your definition? Honestly, I've met some of the most beautiful people who've had IBM. I've been the most inspired. I've gotten the most chills. So I know some folks use it in their definitions in the most beautiful and most powerful way. If you're struggling with that, it's a great topic to continue to mull over. Don't don't stuff it. We're going to talk about stuffing a little later. Don't stuff it. Like jot this down as a concept that maybe you want to talk about with a therapist through like, what is my definition and how am I using IBM? Am I using it to my favor? Am I, am I using it as a giant roadblock right now? Because again, how you define yourself really impacts behavior. I'll pass it to Kelly now. Thanks, guys. Um, hello, everyone. I, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. Um, I'm Kelly Beer. I'm a registered nurse working in Perth, Australia. I work with Professor Marilee Needham at the Myositis Discovery Program here, and I'm really delighted to join you today. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I guess very similar to Megan and Alice, and I do just want to start with a little bit of qualification and limitation to what I'll talk about. So I'm going to be talking to you today from my position and experience as a registered nurse and working with lots of chronic disease patients and, and very specifically in, um, specializing in IBM over the last five years or so. There are definitely limitations to what I can talk about because I'm not a qualified psychologist or psychiatrist. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that when we do talk about mental health and have these conversations, they can feel overwhelming. And I think Megan and Alison have positioned us really beautifully today um, in, you know, our aims are really to help with some insight, to help with some understanding about how these different concepts of mental health might be impacting you. And I think they also got it exactly right. Um, they're going to say everything amazing um, tonight, which is great. Um, in, in when they said that this is actually, a lot of this is really common across chronic disease um, and really across just, just life um, and particularly healthy aging. So IBM does introduce a, a new component to that. And what I'd like to do tonight as well is, I, I guess, draw on the experience that we have with patients in clinic and what we see in reality of how this journey can be um, and how IBM can impact some of these concepts. So I think that was a fantastic um, grounding in self-concept and understanding who you are um, and what makes up um, your impression of who you are and what you do. And quite often, I think we need to consider how IBM actually impacts that self-concept because we know that chronic progressive diseases do increase um, people's risk of, of feeling symptoms of anxiety and depression. 
And there's no doubt that IBM and what it brings with it does impact things like our self-image when we think about um, the changes to appearance that occur, the change to what we can physically do, perhaps the changes to what we wear, how we present ourselves, um, you know, particularly for women, that can be something big for us. In respect to ideal self, and we're going to talk about roles and relationships a little bit more soon, but I think that's a really big one because IBM um, really can manage to rob people of the things that they plan to do or the things that they love doing by its impact on our physical abilities. And I think that's really important that ideal self is certainly something that might be changing with a diagnosis of IBM and perhaps changing as the IBM journey goes on as well. And in respect, as I say, we're going to jump into roles and relationships um, in a minute and delve into that a little bit further. But when we consider our own self, um, how we value ourselves, how we see ourselves in our communities and our families, that's really uh, ties in so closely to self-esteem. And I think we do see, and again, as, as Megan and Alison touched on, I think we see sometimes the biggest challenges at diagnosis for people whose self-concept um, and maybe a lot of their world is really tied to perhaps physical attributes um, and, and physical roles. And people who perhaps have a greater insight um, or a better understanding of how they can cope with those changes might do a little better when that diagnosis first hits and there are going to be changes in their lives. So I think reflecting and understanding um, and having taking that time to um, just think about how you see yourself, how you view yourself, what your ideal self are, they are really important elements of getting to grips uh, with a condition like IBM and starting to understand how we can live beside it as well. So uh, Megan and Alison, did you guys have anything more you wanted to add on self-concept before we move on? Or are there any questions that we need to cover at this stage? Hey, I guess, um, Kelly, thank you. Because you brought up something that I had actually had a discussion with, um, with a, a therapist one time about how our self-image can be very skewed if we do have um, any sort of kind of depressive or anxiety-like symptoms. We may have um, a more negative view um, or a not that accurate of a view, or we just have a harder time seeing some of the positive attributes that we do hold, which um, it's nice to have a nice objective view conversation with someone, someone who you trust. Uh, it could be a licensed therapist. It could also be um, a support in your personal life that you very much trust and have a nice, open, honest conversation. And and when it comes to self-esteem, be very aware, you know, if someone is giving you um, some objective feedback that's positive, be mindful if you have the tendency to try to reject it. Um, it is kind of a defense coping mechanism we tend to do. Um, and I call it, that's like the little depressive or anxiety mind. That's not you, that, that's that kind of depressive anxiety mind. Um, I, I think having a nice conversation with someone where you're just actively listening about their feedback, about their perspective of you can be helpful. Um, to help maybe gain some perspective if you're having a hard time gaining some perspective. Right, well, this very much flows into the next concept we were talking about and Kelly alluded to, which is kind of defining your own role and, and role performance. Um, in the occupational therapy world, this is a huge part of what we do as OTs as we evaluate what your important roles are in life. And um, when, I, when I do kind of literature review of roles, it's so limited. I was just kind of complaining with Allison before this is that it tends to go to like um, romantic relationships and caregiver strain, but really we have a lot of roles we hold throughout life. Um, 
since this is a women's group, mother, grandmother, wife, aunt, sister, caregiver, traveler, supporter, tennis player, head of household chores, even if you didn't want to be, <laughs> uh, friend. Um, I, I think it's a really nice kind of self-reflecting activity is to sit and think about what roles you have held over the years um, and what roles you currently hold um, and which ones you identify with. So I, I really encourage you to take the time to think about, okay, what roles do have I had and what do I have? What do, roles do I really like? Which roles do I really not like? Which roles do I miss? Um, kind of spend some time with that. Again, if you have a pen and paper, it's a great activity to do. If not, this is again, kind of one of those check mark topics to maybe talk through with like a therapist or a, a supportive person. Within kind of the literature about roles, there's a concept called role strain. There's also a concept called role overload, but um, I liked role strain because because I felt like this is related to some folks with IBM, which is it refers to the stress for whatever reason that a person can't meet their the demand of their role. And I just want to like almost address that definition, even though that's from the literature. It's the person can't meet their perception of their definition of the role. Um, because a role can have many definitions. For example, I consider myself a caregiver of my parents. I don't live in the same state as my parents. So my caregiving role is defined as my emotional support that I provide multiple times a day on the phone. Um, whereas some folks might view a caregiver role as like physically doing something for someone. Um, so... So the definition of a role uh, can can very much be a self-determined definition. Um, what a, what you know a mother's role may be when their child is young is defined as something which is much different as a mother's role when their child is grown. So um, another good self-reflective activity is not only what are your roles, but how have you defined them? And I think that's an important concept. I'm going to hand it over to Allison. Why it's important to think about how we define them. Mm -hmm. So role identification is a big thing that comes up with my IBM patients. Um, and a big thing that I do like to talk about kind of where do you see yourself right now? How are you defining what role you are in? Um, a lot of times we do have those people, especially in this type of group, they were always the caregiver, whether they were the mother or something like that, taking care of their parents. Um, sometimes they do kind of have to reverse those roles a little bit and might need a little bit more help, which can definitely be a tough adjustment. But like Megan said, that role can have a bunch of different definitions. Um, you're not set in soon exactly what one role might mean. It's very much individualized. So you kind of take away from that role what you want to take away from it. Um, for example, you might be someone, speaking from personal experience, I do not have IBM, but I had to have neck surgery. And before my surgery, I identified myself as a runner. I was then told after my surgery, you're not allowed to run anymore, which was a pretty devastating thing for me. It was a big part of my life, but then kind of adapting with that thinking, okay, there's still things that I'm able to do. I can walk my dog, I can go for hikes, I can do all these different types of things. It might not be that exact definition of a role that I had before, but how am I able to kind of adapt that role to meet my own kind of self-concept, to meet my own values um, and what I am physically able to do without introducing that role strain by trying to force myself into a role 
that might not meet me where I am physically or mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And I think, um, again, this is another like kind of food for thought, self-reflection, identify if you are defining a role and in, in whatever role it is, and you have some role strain, it's causing you stress. Do you find yourself fighting that and continuing to try to do the role or, um, are you having a hard time? Are you grieving a role? All of that, like we'll get into when we talk about coping skills, mm -hmm. it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to feel the feelings, but it's a nice um, kind of a uh, talking point when it comes to some, like a therapist or, or a support system. Maybe the, the feelings you're having is because the roles that you once experienced, you might be grieving, you might be resisting a change to role, um, your roles might be reprioritized and it wasn't your choice. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of feelings and emotions that go with that. And it's okay to mm -hmm. to feel angry and sad and upset. Um, and it's a great topic to work at, with someone over mm -hmm. time with with navigating that. Um, it's, I was talking to my therapist friend and kind of the concept of like, who am I is often you answer that question by starting well, and you start with what you do for a living. We kind of define ourselves through our roles. And when that role becomes too, you know, difficult and you have role strain, you then think, well, then who am I? And it's also important to recognize similar to how your self-concept is going to kind of change a little bit over time. We're constantly changing through different roles in our life. Um, so you might start off as a child and then become a mother and then become a grandmother. That's kind of a natural progression into different roles in your life. IBM's going to disrupt that a little bit. It's not necessarily an expected role change that you would foresee. But it's important to remember you've been changing roles your entire life and adapting and kind of making things work and finding the best roles that identify and define who you are as a person. So kind of taking that, um, I've certainly worked with IBM patients who have really embraced their role as someone with IBM and have kind of transitioned that used to see themselves as a caregiver and someone who really enjoys helping people and being there for other people and have been able to channel their in, um, their energy into the different IBM organizations to really help others with the disease as well. So kind of embracing their new roles in life while still kind of calling back to those old roles um, that they had in the past, but still identify with today. I think that was a shout out to Nancy. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> uh, sorry, Kelly, we're talkers. So I'm going <laughs> to hand it off to you. And thank you guys. <laughs> no, I, lo I love it. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure everyone else is the same as me in sitting here and just um, my mind going a, a million directions with, with so much amazing, you know, it's great information. These topics are so important to talk about. I think the thing that is coming through um, from what Megan and Alison are really talking about as well is that really deliberate decision to make some conscious choices around this and some really conscious reflections. And I think that's a real theme that you're going to hear throughout this um, this talk. And I, I think there's going to be a lot of information, but taking one thing away, even, even for now, I'd be saying, you know, be thinking about how often we're talking about deliberate actions of checking in with yourself, of checking in about how IBM or even other things in your life are impacting what you can do, the roles you have, your self-concept, that really important checking in and actually being deliberate. I love that concept of um, grieving a role and grieving and talking about a role that we lose because I don't think we do that very well and I'm talking from our perspective in clinic and supporting patients but even that is a really simple thing that I think we could call out and do a lot better so there's there's so much amazing stuff here um, and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to build um, and complement 
the information um, that Megan and Alison have have just given. And I guess I'd like to maybe shift a little towards relationships because this has been an area that we've been looking at within our team um, and research that we've been doing a bit as well. This quote that you'll see um, up the top is actually from um, a publication um, a couple of years ago that I can share with you. Sorry, I lost a reference in my slide. But I've just bolded that statement that if you're receiving care, you can feel more like a patient than a partner. And I think I'd like to talk about relationships because it, they're one of the real, really um, challenging and important scenarios that we see with patients um, with IBM. And I don't think we discuss it um, really enough in clinical care. We do sometimes um, find that sometimes our, our consults are a little bit more like marriage counselling and maybe like 10% IBM care and, and that's okay but we don't tend to really discuss relationships a lot unless it's really obvious that there's strains or issues or challenges that we can help to address and I think that's a little bit um, of a, a point that we miss when we look after people not only with IBM but across actually all chronic diseases. One of the reasons why I think it it might be um, particularly so in IBM and maybe not at Hopkins where they have su such a, a broad program for IBM and, and we do as well in Australia, but perhaps at other places that don't have the big myositis teams. But one of the challenges with IBM is we often have hospital-based care of IBM patients. So you're often seeing quite a senior specialist clinician in a big teaching hospital environment. And when we see you there, that's quite a different picture that we get about how you are and how you're coping and what your wider support system and relationships and roles look like than when sometimes when we care for you in the community. And with different chronic diseases, um, nurses, OTs, physios, we'll be seeing people in the community. And quite often it gives us a much better insight into what's actually happening in the wider picture of that person's lives. So I think the fact that we often have hospital-based appointments to check in with people in IBM means that sometimes we miss this element of care. One of the other things that we see in clinic quite a bit is that changing roles and relationships can be hard to predict and can be hard to navigate because with IBM, we don't always understand what you, you what disease progression is for different people what kind of disabilities or abilities people may have in, in five or 10 years, what support they might need. Um, and that can be really difficult because it's perhaps unlike other diseases that have a much clearer progression where we can be having conversations about support systems, changing roles, relationships, um, because sometimes we end up being much more reactive than proactive, I think, in IBM when we're not quite sure what that trajectory will be. Um, and as you, you'll know with IBM, you know, your experience, even though the, the disease progression, we, we think it's fairly slow and we think it's quite a linear um, progression. I, I think the, the patient experience of disease is that it often has big jumps and changes where, where things do change for you quite drastically. And then we do play catch up with um, the things that you, you may no longer be able to do and how that impacts relationships. I do want to call out a couple of um, particular challenges that have arisen. So we've recently done, uh, undertaken a little bit of research. This is a, a patient-led research project that's looked at um, patient and carer priorities in inclusion body myositis. So it's using some techniques from the marketing world. We had a patient that was really keen to pursue this research topic, so became an adjunct professor under our team um, through the university and has um, designed and delivered research that we're just writing up. But we started with some workshops to try uh, with, with patients and carers um, to try and pull out priorities. And really interesting things came out that we hadn't necessarily thought about. Challenges for those who are single or don't necessarily have geographically available support networks was really important. So we do talk about um, relationships. We talk about partners um, becoming carers. And I think we understand that relationship a bit. But for people who are single or might have their support networks who aren't living in the next suburbs, um, there, are, there are very different challenges, again, that I think sometimes we miss and we don't have some good answers for. We also found that physical intimacy and sexuality 
we don't discuss in IBM. So again, you know, we're missing a really big part of our roles, our identity, our relationships, you know, whether, you know, whether you have a partner or not, this is all a really big part of who we are. And, and we don't often talk about that again, unless it's, it's raised by patients um, or unless it's something that, that we feel is particularly specific to that consult. So it becomes a bit of an, an unspoken topic and, and perhaps has a bit of challenge and, and stigma around raising that as well. So this is a, a really big field. I think um, here is somewhere that we can do a lot more to understand impacts of IBM and to understand where what the gaps are between what people with IBM experience in terms of role and relationship changes and how we support that as um, health professionals in a clinic environment and how we acknowledge and and actually address some of those things so there's a lot here I'm going to stop there because otherwise I'll be talking for a long time about this um and our research on that should be hopefully coming out towards probably start of next year by the time we we write up and publish um so yeah any questions or, or Megan Allison anything to add um I'm glad that you kind of brought up like the role of the relationship and the role changes. I've certainly had patients over the years who've just kind of having their partner need to do more for them um, and just kind of transitioning sometimes to having your loved one become a little more of a caregiver um, can be frustrating to a lot of people, understandably. Um, but sometimes I also introduce to my patients kind of like reframing their mindset a little. Um, I've had patients who've struggled with things like being able to put on a jacket or being able to open doors um, just because of their strength. So their husband's kind of jumping in to help them out. And my patients have said, oh, people are looking at me. They think I can't take care of myself. So I kind of do a little exercise with them, like try to reframe it from the stranger's point of view, they're probably just seeing your husband who loves you very much, just being very courteous and gracious towards you, um, which isn't to dismiss their feelings at all. Um, it's certainly understandable for them to be upset if they're having a loss of function. Um, but I think also a helpful exercise to kind of acknowledge where that help is coming from. It's coming from a place of love. Um, which I think can help you really feel connected with your partner again, versus feeling that they have to take care of you. It can kind of be changed into, this is a part of your relationship, um, that you have that mutual love for one another as well. Um, and I also think I've only ever had one IBM patient bring up uh, intimacy with me, but he was a man. But if that is ever an issue, if you're seeing me in clinic, feel free to bring it up because that is within the OT scope of practice. And I love to make sure that's addressed for people because I know it is a very important um, place for a lot of people and even just emotional intimacy as well. Great, thank you, that, that's great. So um, as we go forward, ladies, I don't see a lot of questions. Um, and, and I do want to say that as we're going through, I hope we're taking notes because next month, what we're going to do is we're going to have a um, networking session and uh, small breakout groups. And hopefully you we can put together a list of questions from here and from today that we'll be able to sit down and talk about amongst ourselves um, within the break the breakout rooms. So as you're listening to these six categories, please make some notes of things that you would like to talk about in in the breakout rooms. Um, going next, Allison that. and Megan. <laughs> um, I just had one more comment that yeah. I I think Kelly did a great job pointing out some of the topics that aren't brought up in, in clinics. And I turned to Allison, I said, oh, we've got to add that. We've got to add that. Um, we've started adding some mental yes, health at least. We do. <laughs> um, I would 
highly encourage, um, you know, I, I wish the healthcare system was in a way where these topics were brought up by the health professionals. I like, it sounds like Kelly is a huge advocate for that. We'll be a huge advocate for that. However, um, the realistic side is probably not. So highly encourage you to be strong advocates for yourself and bring up those concepts. If the, if the medical team's getting uncomfortable by it, you know what, that means you maybe find uh, a different outlet like the support group or a therapist where you get to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, we we need to talk about these things. Uh, just because no one talks about it doesn't mean it's not there. So anyways, Kelly, thanks for bringing that up. Um, good food for thought. Kelly, we're going to pick your brain from now on. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're going to do some cool stuff together, guys. This is going to be a <laughs> some good things we can do together. Yeah. Uh, the next kind of topic was kind of coping skills. Yeah. And my first hard line that I tell everyone I always work with, it's okay to not be okay. We don't have to fake it. Emotions are real. I'm such a science brain. Like there's literal hormones being released. There are literal chemicals being released. It's not just like a character personality. Emotions happen. If you're sad, it's okay. Like if you're mad, it is okay. If you're jealous, if you are resentful, like it's okay to not be okay. Um, doesn't mean you have to live in that space forever. Uh, that's kind of the whole concept of coping skills. But I think the first thing is like, give yourself permission to not be okay. Um, you have, you want to bring up your study? that you Yeah. Did? So there's actually studies out there that say, if you repress just natural emotions and don't let yourself express them in a healthy way, it can actually exacerbate chronic illness symptoms and actually worsen your health outcomes. So that's not to say if you're feeling mad to stay mad for a week straight and feel nothing else. No, it's acknowledge that you're mad and express that emotion efficiently and then utilize your healthy coping skills to kind of move on from that emotion. Mm -hmm. The more you kind of repress that emotion, the more negative health outcomes that you are prone to have. Yeah. So I just wanted to, um, just from kind of, this is more my mental health hat on. We talk about coping skills all the time. Um, as humans, we, this is, this is, I think the thing we work on the most and I'm totally guilty about like, do as I say, not as I do. I'm someone who needs this advice too. So, um, just very common coping mechanisms where I don't want to, just label them as negative or unhealthy. I just want to label them as try to be aware of if you catch yourself doing this. Um, one is stuffing emotions. You know, if you're in a situation and you're starting to feel an emotion, um, yes, of, of course, like you can't like flip a table or, or, you know, slap, slap a husband, but, um, you know, trying to, uh, feel that rather than kind of stuff it, because if you stuff it, the emotion's still there. It's just like got a little ammo behind it. So then when it comes out later, it's like taking a, a soda bottle, shaking it, and then opening the top. Like it's, it's going to explode. Um, so be aware. Again, this is all being more mindful. I'm not here to tell you like that is bad because I do that sometimes. Um, venting can be very healthy. Poor Allison, no, she hears me vent all the time. However, uh, if I vent to her and then six other people, the same story, it's turned from kind of venting to kind of living in that space that might not feel so good. You might have the intention of getting it off your chest, but what you've actually done is maybe reactivated the stress system in your brain. Um, I call it like getting amygdala hijacked. So your amygdala is the part of your brain that like is responsible for like anger and like stress. Um, and so sometimes when we kind of stay in that space, our amygdala is just having a party in our brain and, and uh, releasing all of our stress hormones. Just be mindful if you're someone who tries to avoid, you know, uh, 
maybe uh, topics or, um, you know, say like that whole role performance and, and you recognize that maybe a role def definition that you once had is, is no longer working for you instead of talking about it with someone, maybe avoiding it. Again, we want to be catching these, being more mindful, isolating. If, if you're someone, especially with the physical component of IBM, um, if you're finding yourself coping with the physical challenges by just isolating and not going out, there's um, there can be some potential emotional consequences of that. So again, this is like this is like taking a highlighter and just kind of being like, oops, I might do that. I might do that. I don't know if doom scrolling is the right word. I don't know what you young people use anymore, but this is what I mean by this. Uh, and I'm totally guilty. Um, social media, very entertaining, but also can be highlighting all these like people living seemingly beautiful, perfect lives. And it can cause like some unsettled feelings about your own life. Um, again, so being mindful. I think catastrophizing is maybe like Allison and I talked about this before, maybe one being one of the most common coping mechanism we might hear. Um, and this is when you take a situation, you kind of think about the worst case scenario. And it's tough with IBM because sometimes when you want to do something, you've got to plan pretty excessively to make sure you can successfully do it. Like if I want to go out to dinner, I go out to dinner. For someone who with IBM who goes out to dinner, they have to think, okay, is there accessible parking? Is there a curb to get into the restaurant? How low are the seats? Is there bar height? What if people want to talk to me while I'm eating? What if everyone finishes so much faster than I finish? Like there's all this like thinking that goes into it um, and it's necessary, but it's also kind of exhausting. So again, this is not like labeling it good or bad. It's just being kind of mindful of it. Um, excessive thinking to solve a problem. If you find yourself kind of uh, thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and trying to think your way into the solution. Again, be aware of it. It can be quite exhausting. Uh, mental energy can le lend itself to some physical fatigue. And the last one to be aware of is comparing. Um, it's kind of obvious, like the comparing where it's, um, well, I see so-and-so my same age I graduated high school with, they're off roaming through Italy and you know, you kind of feel maybe that resentful, that sadness, the jealousy, uh, it can be tough, but also the same opposite, like, well, you know, at least I'm not, you know, starving or homeless and, and you're trying to make yourself feel better. But what you're actually doing is you're like not validating that you've got it tough too. Like it's okay to not be okay. Um, it's, it's also terrible to be homeless and starving, but you're also going through a tough spot too. So you don't have to try to invalidate your own self. So again, those are things to kind of be mindful of. Some coping mechanisms that I recommend that I know personally I found helpful and, and uh, when I work with my patients, gratitude listing. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, studies behind. I went to like these whole classes on gratitude. Um, you know, you've heard the typical, like, write three things that you're grateful for. Uh, that's actually like, okay, but it's fun to be um, creative with gratitude listing. Like, what's one invention that I'm super grateful for? Like, I'm super grateful for indoor plumbing. It would really stink to have to go to the bathroom in an outhouse with IBM. Like, you know, um, kind of being creative with gratitude listing. Mindfulness exercises, oh my gosh, I could speak to you guys for, for days. So um, I'm going to kind of leave it at mindfulness, which is like <laughs> meditation, body scans, um, hobbies and leisure. For OT, uh, we kind of have this concept that idle time is the devil's workshop. And like, if you don't have things going on and you're sitting idly, one, it doesn't feel good. And two, our brain doesn't sit in like a nice happy place often. We're often searching for fear and threat and we might think about and dwell on some things that we're unhappy about. So being engaged in something healthy um, that you enjoy is a great way to cope. But also recognizing that there may be times where your past leisure activities might not be as safe or as easy to do. So recognizing if that's the case, 
that might not be the coping mechanism to utilize in that instant. That might actually make you more frustrated and kind of more down on yourself. But at the same time, recognizing those things that you enjoy and seeing, is there a way I can kind of modify this or adapt it so I can still do it? So for example, I had someone who was big into knitting, but just working with the needles was getting more difficult. So then they started taking up arm knitting instead. It was a little easier for them to do. I see a confused look. It's like, you're basically using your arms as the knitting needles. So you're not working with tiny little needles, but just kind of going like that. Um, so it's still taking something that you enjoy um, and being able to find a way to express yourself, um, but if there's something that is going to be more difficult for you to do, kind of think about it. What about this that I enjoy and how can I kind of modify it into something that I'm able to do and will find relaxing still? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I listed some other coping mechanisms. I mean, you can talk about coping mechanisms for days. I had to put animals on there because <laughs> I watch a cute animal video. I'm good for the day. Not really, but it can lift a mood. It can be that enough distracting moment to get me out of a cycle of maybe catastrophizing. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy, did you um have did you need to jump in with something? Okay, all oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Um gosh. I think that was a, a great overview. And I, I think, again, there's so much in there that's just applicable to all of us and, and everyday life, you know, um, not, not notwithstanding IBM and the impact. So I, I think a lot of this is going to echo um, what Megan and Alison is talking about. And I just wanted us to consider for a moment, you know, what not coping looks like for you um, and to have that reflection. And as um, Alison and Megan have said, that self-awareness and insight of what your coping mechanisms are and what it looks like when you're not coping is really important. I've got some glasses down the bottom um, filled with different amounts because I think it's really important to understand that your ability to cope um, is something that really fluctuates. And we know that we all have different capacity to cope with different things. And IBM for some people is something that might at times nearly make that cup completely full. So it's not going to take a lot before people aren't coping. And particularly if you're going through a transition time in disease, if other things um, are going on in your life that are also making it difficult to cope, that cup is going to be pretty quickly overflowing. So understanding what sorts of things um, actually are filling that cup is really quite important for you. And understanding in your life the short-term stresses that you might have or, or things, um, whether it's, you know, a leaky roof or needing to fix a car or, you know, a friend sending a text that you didn't like, whatever it might be, versus the things that are, that are more long-term and more ongoing. So understanding whether you're really operating with a pretty empty cup where you can take on a fair bit and you can cope with a fair bit, or actually whether you're operating at, at the moment at a point that you really can't manage much more and I think that can help to understand um, when you might find it difficult to cope and then to have a think about okay well in this situation what are the things that I can change to maybe mean that that cup's no longer overflowing and then certainly to be using some of those um, techniques uh, you know, mindfulness techniques and, and gradually the the great thing now is and I, I think we'll move on to some of the support systems um soon but there are some really great resources out there and I know a couple have been popped in the chat as well there are different things that work for different people but you often don't lose anything by trying something um, so I think you know we're we're really lucky that there are a lot of resources and that can be a good way to start asking for help as well um, in in a way that doesn't feel so difficult you know to ask others what do you find works for you is there a particular philosophical approach or is there a particular app or a particular website something that helps you with coping and that's a really good way sometimes to open up that conversation um, about how you're doing and how you're coping so that's that's it for me for this one um anything more to add or questions at this point 
I think a really great follow-up from what Kelly was saying is when you guys do your breakout rooms, Nancy, one uh -huh. of the topics could be like, let's share the coping skills and coping mechanisms that really work for you mm -hmm. because Kelly totally said it perfect. It's so different for everyone. And there's some coping mechanisms that might work for you one day and not as well as the other day. So having a nice variety and hearing what works for other people can be powerful. Mm -hmm. But also recognizing that that one thing is going to work for every single person. You need to kind of identify what's going to work for you. So for example, when my husband is feeling stressed and anxious, he likes to play what he calls relaxing music, but it actually makes me more anxious. Mm -hmm. I can't explain it, but if something's working for someone, it may work for you, but it may not. So it's kind of important to just explore what is going to be the best option for you. Um, I, I have to say, you guys are absolutely incredible. There, there are so many notes. I hope that we're able to get through this. Um, <laughs> to, to not, not get through this, but it's going to be fascinating to just really be able to hone in and talk in small groups about coping, about our individual aspects of who we are and, and what we're doing, what our roles are. So let's go into the next topic, resilience and resiliency factors. Yeah, resilience is a, a big ticket item for psychological research these days. And I love it because um, it's kind of relatively new age. I don't know. Am I dating myself? Maybe I am. <laughs> but I love, love, love this quote, and I hope you kind of read it and let it sink in. Um, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I won't be reduced by it. It's by Maya Angelou. And I thought when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is something I need to remember for the rest of my life, because there are going to be so many things outside of your control that if we had control over it, we wouldn't choose that. I bet IBM is one of those where it's completely out of your control. And had you had a computer programming option, you may not have chosen that. Um, and so, yes, IBM is going to change what happens. It's going to change physically. It might change, you know, your context, your environment, but you don't have to be reduced by it. And I felt like that was a good quote to enter into talking about resiliency. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of definitions of resilience, but basically it's kind of being able to bounce back, being able to successfully adapt to life experiences. Um, and I guess for, for Allison and I's sake, I just wanted to uh, introduce you to some factors that the literature has shown to help improve a person's resiliency. So you can actually work on your ability to be resilient, which I really love because um, there's so much that is outside of our control, but this is actually something we could work on building. Um, and they've shown that there are four factors that we could try to work on to improve our resiliency or ability to handle difficult situations. One is support. Um, it has shown that uh, the more support you have, it increases your resilience. So we're going to talk about support systems. So all I'll say at this point is this is kind of a mental note or a physical note you, you jot down. What are my supports? This is important for my ability to build resiliency. Coping skills. Um, I've done a lot of, I'm, I'm quite obsessed with reading about longevity and, you know, those, those blue zones and what are the common factors for those who live like long, but good quality life. And a very common thread is a person's ability to adapt or cope with stress. Um, so something that increases your resilience is having a variety of coping mechanisms to cope. Um, another, and so again, question to ask yourself are what are my coping skills? How, how do I learn more about some options? Um, 
self-compassion. So a factor for this would be kind of, it, it reverts back to that kind of self-concept. What is our definition of ourself? Um, my favorite word recently has been grace. Like, do I give myself some grace? Uh, because I'm just human, you know? <laughs> uh, do, I, do I give myself some slack? And the last one, from an OT perspective, we love our cognition. And so I, I really believe in this, in that cognitive agility helps improve resilience. Um, you know, I, I happen to help lead an inpatient psychiatric unit. And, you know, when I'm talking with folks, maybe with anger um, or, or strong depressive symptoms, and I say, it's, it's very, you know, you don't get to use your full brain when you get to decide just to give up or you, you're not using all your cognitive skills when you decide like, oh, everything is terrible. You get to use your whole brain when you are planning through something and problem solving and seeing the big picture and being flexible and trying to develop empathy. Um, and so I totally wholeheartedly agree that cognitive agility, you know, using some of those, those skills can help improve resilience. So um, I'm going to kind of leave it at that because we're going to talk about it unless Allison, poor Allison, she's so <laughs> used to me being so chatty. Um, yeah, the one thing I wanted to add is resilience is a big part. Um, especially of like a chronic disease kind of process, but even just for life in general. Um, and in that name of resiliency is that adaptation. That is something we are constantly looking at as OT. So if you see me in clinic, I might've been like, here's some adaptive equipment that you should check out to kind of help you adapt with any physical changes. But recently we started trying to do a measure to really look at the resiliency of our patients. So that way, we're not just looking at what physical adaptations we need to make, but are there any mental adaptations that we need to make to really help our patients thrive in their day-to-day? -day? Thanks. So um, it's a bit of a different quote that I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this actually was a, came from our, our recent study um, from patient and care priorities. And it was just, I mean, really apt, isn't it? Um, I think with resilience, resilience is a tricky one because it is really important. But sometimes I see resilience and the concept being a little bit weaponized. And what I mean by that is that if someone has a challenge or if someone faces something really difficult, that it, it can imply that there's not always space to not be okay with that and to fall apart with that and to not manage that. So I like to think of resilience as an ability to keep going. And in fact, it helps me to think about resilience in that all of us here have managed to get through everything that's been thrown at us in our lives. We all here, we have all managed to cope. We are all resilient because we are still here with whatever's been thrown. So resilience and understanding, and I think it comes back to this insight that Megan and Alison have positioned so beautifully throughout this is understanding for you the things that can help you to go from something that brings you down, that can crush you, that can, can feel overwhelming to a point where you can manage that. So, uh, you know, going back to the, the that cup analogy to really understand what things are modifiable, changeable, I think is, is important as well. We'll come back to um, purpose a little bit, but one thing that I wanted to just touch on is also an ability for you to triage what's going on with the challenges you face and your mental health. So I think it's helpful to think of it like any other injury or illness that we would. So if you cut yourself with a kitchen knife and you look at it and you think, okay, I might just need to put a Band-Aid on it or I might need some stitches. If you fall over and you see a bone sticking out of a limb, you go to the emergency room. So it's really similar with our mental health. We need to understand that things that happen to us that impact our mental health might be things that we can manage and being resilient and coping with those might be something we can manage on our own or perhaps with some support for others. But sometimes actually they're big things that we need to ask for some really professional help with and, and some support. So I, I think, um, you know, we do need to recognise with resilience that 
it, it is a, a process. It, it's not a matter that we can necessarily get to a state that for everything, something can happen to us and we can respond and um, and return to, to where we were. But it, it is going to look different in different situations and with different challenges as well. So I've just put in there that middle point around um, meaning, being able to, to find ways to meaningfully contribute. Um, and I think this really comes back a little bit to the role and, and purpose, but certainly in terms of resilience, having um, a, a something that you do, a, a role that you have, um, understanding what your purpose is, where you fit into your world is really important in being able to get back to that when things sort of knock you off course. So I think we come back to those ideas of insight and really knowing and understanding yourself as, as best you can. Um, so that's it from me for that one. Um, Alison, Megan um, or Nancy, anything to add there? I've just been looking at your little graphic as you've been talking and I wish I could just add in like a little lifesaver float out there that just says support system mm -hmm. because this is going to be a very individualized disease for everyone, but it's important to know you don't have to go through it alone. Um, and having that support will really help you get through the tough days. Um, even if those tough days are still being tough, knowing that you can make it to the next day and it might be a little better. And and I'm I'm just gonna say thank you, but but support system is 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 a biggie because it's different for everybody. But I just want the women that are here tonight to know that, that that's who we are, we're trying to be. So um, sometimes we may not seem as one-on-one, -on -one, but please, you have our email with our Women with IBM group, reach out and whoever we can direct you to, to talk about the things that we're talking about now, we will. So please, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes to ask. And I know as we're going through all of that, that's a big, 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 uh, big problem for some of us. So with that, yeah. Allison, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been kind of talking about support this whole time and it's true. Um, I think taking some self-reflective time to evaluate your support system is a really healthy thing to do um, because uh, support is a pretty generic word. Like I may need support in that I need someone to make me laugh. I may need support in that I need someone to laugh at my bad jokes. Like support varies. Um, so if you, you go on to the next slide, I have some kind of questions on there. Um, you know, like sometimes you'll need someone who can distract you. Sometimes you're going to need someone who listens very deeply. Sometimes you need someone who's going to give you that pep talk or who will understand you or who won't judge you. And, and what I want to put out is that there's probably no one person who's gonna have all of those qualities. Um, so what I'd like you to do for the next like five seconds to 10 seconds um, is, is kind of take a mental check, like how many people in your life would you consider support? Um, I mean, on here, there was a total of 66 people at one point. I was like, whoa, that's so much support. Like, no, it's the computer, but I feel it. Um, if you're kind of doing a mental check in your head and it's like three or less, this is something that I would highly recommend doing some work with because support isn't just, you know, one or two people because they may not be able to provide you the different levels of support you need on every day. Um, it's kind of almost unfair. Like I'll use my husband as an example. It's unfair of me, 
but I do it anyways, to expect him to always know and predict how to support me in a moment, right? Like there are times when I just want him to tell me I'm right, even if I'm wrong. There are times when I want him to just listen. There are also times that I want him to give me honest feedback. Um, but if I put myself in his shoes, it might feel like a roller coaster and he might not be comfortable in all those different roles. And so I really have to evaluate what is my husband really good at? Like what, where it's his seat spot that he does a really good job with. I'm going to go to him when it's that. If I just want to be super, super chatty and someone's going to laugh at all my bad jokes, it's Allison. She's, well, she's my staff member, so she has to or I'll fire her. But, but um, you know, like I have to kind of look at my support system and say, who can I go to for what? Because it can be very frustrating to be in a situation where you're going to someone really wanting maybe like a deep conversation or a deep level of understanding and they don't provide that back to you it can be like really disheartening it can lead to like some angry emotions but when we kind of step back and look maybe they were never at a, a capacity to provide you that like maybe they just don't have the skills it's not quite their fault um and so that's why i say really look at your support system the more folks you have uh, and you can kind of delineate about like who you can go to for what, the better, especially in the world of IBM, having someone you can go to that understands what it's like, like a group like this. Mm -hmm. um, oh my gosh, that's so powerful. Even clinicians, we we can understand, but we can't understand like you guys can. So yeah, a big thing I like to ask my patients is just kind of low. Like, is there anyone you can talk to? Oftentimes I hear, oh, my spouse, oh, my sister, things like that. And goes, yes, that's great. Um, but kind of reminding them that sometimes it's good to have someone who either can really understand what you're talking about, like what Megan's saying, and can really relate to what you're going through with IBM, or also just having an unbiased kind of outlook there for you. So I often will recommend patients looking into TMA and the woman with IBM group, also recommending like the myositis support and understanding group, just to kind of make those connections with people who have either been there, understand what you're going through, or currently going through the same things. Um, people that you can just kind of vent to, people you can kind of bounce ideas off of. Um, but I've also um, asked people to consider just talking with like a mental health therapist, because they're going to give you that kind of unbiased view. Um, they don't know who you are. They're going to kind of give it to you without any kind of discriminatory feelings getting in the way and can kind of give you a kind of like a broader outlook on everything without their own emotions coming into play, which can be helpful. Yeah, so I think that's a great summary and, and I won't really add too much here. Um, really things that we've discussed from my perspective, I think we, we've talked about it being quite individualised, but definitely um, we know that just having this conversation and bringing up this topic is difficult and we know that we're not always very good and very deliberate at doing that in clinics. So I think like Megan was saying earlier, we'd really encourage you to be advocates to, to have this discussion if we're not seeing it and we know that there are gaps that we can do better in, in doing that as well. So just exactly as um, Alison's described, you know, be de really deliberate in actually getting your um, support network together and, and knowing how they are and being able to check on yourself and even that support system regularly, you know, don't be afraid to say to people, hey, will you be my person that I can come to when I'm feeling like this? Or, you know, it's like having your own board of directors, isn't it? Where you have someone that does a finance and someone that does the project management. It's, it's like that really for your mind. So you have key people um, who you know can help you. If you're someone that really likes to have tools and a more objective ways to check in on how you're doing, I've used some acronyms here um, just for, for space, but there are some validated questionnaires that we can point you towards that we use in clinical settings. There's one, the PWR is a personal, personal wellbeing index, the person health questionnaire. Um, so there's lots of different tools that we use. 
We have a medical student this year, actually, who's um, just writing up a small survey he did looking at four different um, measures of well-being, anxiety and depression um, to see in, in the IBM population to see which one we think might be the most appropriate. So we asked for participants to give a lot of feedback on those tools and how relevant they felt they were for um, IBM. So hopefully that'll give us some ideas for what might be good to use. There are lots of um, quite passive things that you can do. So apps and podcasts are a great way to start and say there were some resources popped in the chat and absolutely acknowledging that we are all different. We're going to need different things at different times and different things for different challenges. So even the things that work for you for one challenge, understand that you might need to find something else or a difference like that triage I mentioned, different thing um, to help you through it, a different challenge as well. And I think the graphic here, I just, one quote that I really love is what you don't change, you choose. And I think that's really apt because often we feel like a lot of um, power and choice can be taken away in chronic disease or something like IBM. So I think, you know, I often talk to patients and, and ask a question of um, how long would you like to live for? And depending on the answer, it might be five years, 10 years, 20 years to say, okay, how long do you think you're going to live for? Again, we'll, we'll see where we end up. And I say, if you've got 10 years left, do you want to spend the next 10 years doing the things that you're doing now? Because if not, we need to help you change those things. Because by doing nothing, you're choosing your, your same reality. So I think it, it's sometimes a different way to look at, um, to look at action because action can be uncomfortable and action can be really hard. Um, so that's it for me on this one. <laughs> so, we're so chatty. I love it. We could take up a few hours here. <laughs> Kelly, I'm, I'm sorry, Megan, Allison, do you have any uh, follow-up for this? No, I was just sitting and reflecting on that last question that Kelly was posing, and that's quite powerful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad, you know, I, I'm so grateful to have even three of you here tonight. Um, and we are, ladies, I, I hope it's okay. We are going to go a little bit late. So this is the last one on on setting boundaries. Um, there is so much information that that we're getting. This is being recorded. Um, hopefully, we can we will have access to it. But uh, I'm really looking forward to talking next month and getting feedback. So with that. Uh, Megan and Allison. <laughs> um, setting boundaries. I could talk for days. It's a one a, a very big topic I talk about in mental health. I guess the focus I want to say for this is you are a priority, and that is that. Okay, you heard it from me. You're a priority. Um. I don't know, maybe we take on this role of caregiving and worrying about how others are feeling and perceiving and, and stuff like that. And that's fine. You, we all have good hearts. We really do. Um, you're a priority still. And so when I think of setting boundaries, I think about it in a little bit in context of some of those support systems or the people around you. Um, and if you have to set a boundary with someone, it may be because... Um, maybe that person's draining a little bit of energy from you, or you're not feeling so good after you leave an interaction with that person. Um, setting a boundary does not mean that you are a mean or bad person, or that you need to kick people out of your life, or you need to isolate from all others. What it means is you're, you're prioritizing you and your well-being. And oh, gosh, that is a probably the most beautiful thing a human can do because we will never be able to be that nice, friendly, wonderful person to be around if we're, we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, boundaries also mean you're being really intentional about your relationships. Like I was saying with support systems, if I go to my husband and want a nice deep conversation where he validates everything I say and he doesn't, um, like if I go to him and know like how our relationship is, I, I can be a little more intentional um, about that. And then I know who I can go to for what. So I guess kind of the summary I want to say is, is you're a priority. 
you matter, your feelings matter, and it's okay to not be okay and set up boundaries to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And also remembering that sometimes that might mean setting boundaries for yourself. So kind of imagine going back to those roles. There's a role that you used to fit in perfectly and you absolutely want to get back into that role. But if you try breaking through that boundary, your satisfaction is not going to be quite where it was before. But if you kind of look around the fence of that boundary, there's another role out there that still fits who you are as a person. And that boundary is accepting and kind of welcoming of you where you are in this space and time. Set yourself that boundary. I need to kind of identify what I can or cannot do, but especially recognizing I'm so worthy of being as best as I can be and who I most want to be in this point in time. So just kind of setting those boundaries for yourself as well, identifying if I try to do this, it might not be the best thing mentally for me. It might not put me in a good mental space, but how can I kind of work around that one and get myself into a good space? Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, the only thing I'll just add um, quickly that, to that is just that I think it can be helpful to consider boundaries um, and setting boundaries around balance. So for you, it's about making sure that you are balancing your activities and will hopefully skewing your activities more towards things that are energizing rather than energy depleting. Um, and I think, you know, that word energy is really important. And we know that things that are energizing and depleting look really different for different people. So I put the same things in both um, and also look really, you know, they might be different for you on a different day. So there are some days that catching up with family might absolutely be an energizing activity that you want to say yes to, but on other days it would just be too much for so many reasons. And, and then it's going to be something that you need to have that boundary and, and say no to for your own benefit. So just understanding there's that balance that drives it, that trying to make sure that the things you're doing and where you're spending your energy on are on the activities that are on that energizing side and not the depleting. Yeah, I, I, think nice that's a really, <laughs> I think that's a really good self-reflective activity is spending some time um, identifying some activities that deplete you Um so that you're mindful going into those activities. So going to the doctor's office might deplete you, but you still have to anyways. So you may want to uh, just highlight them so you know maybe how to structure your day the rest of the day. So a really, I think that's a really good self-reflective activity. So as we are um, at the end of our six topics, um, I see Oh, no, Kelly, we oh, have... So I'd, sorry, I'd put a couple... I'd just put this slide in here um, quickly, Nancy. So just really to, I guess, give us a, a bit of a direction. And I think the main thing I'd want to highlight with the interest of time here is just that oh, there is okay. research There is research going on um, here and we are getting better at this. So, you know, I understand the Hopkins team, um, you guys are undertaking some work um, looking more at mental health and we're really excited to see what you do in this space and how we can learn from that. Um, we have a few little projects going on here, the, the patient-led research project I mentioned and a few student projects. And there's been some really um, great papers, one that came out last month from um, a German group actually looking at quality of life in IBM that I can share the link to, I think it's in one of the next slides. Um, and I think you'll find that it really resonates with you. It look, looks a lot at relationships as well. Um, but the only other thing I really want to highlight here is how important it is for us to work with you guys to understand what is important for people with IBM and what we can do better as, as health professionals. Megan and Alison, is there anything um, you'd like to, to comment on, on anything there? No, I, I very much agree. I know this was a lot of us talking, but I'm so excited about what you guys are going to do next month. And, you know, if there's a lot of information that you guys gleaned, I think that's, again, health professionals still need to learn more about what's working um, from those with IBM. So, 
Yeah, and I do apologize for us being so chatty, but I think it kind of goes back to when Kelly said, these are things that aren't readily talked about by the general, general healthcare population, but just the general population as a whole. So we're all pretty um, passionate <laughs> about it, I would say. So any chance we can get to talk about it and kind of initiate that conversation, we're absolutely going to do it. And like has been said in the past, whenever you go to any kind of appointment, whether it be doctors, uh, rehab therapists, um, anything like that, advocate for yourself. Say, this is something I'm struggling with and I really want to figure out either maybe not an exact solution, but what are strategies I can use to really kind of try to work on these things? Uh, I, I'm i somebody who talks too much frequently, but I I can't, I, I, I always wanted to be able to introduce the Australia portion to John Hopkins and um, Kelly, with that, I, Allison and Megan were the, the two guinea pigs at first. But tonight's program was absolutely, there's, there's so much in it. I, I can't thank you enough. But it, it's wonderful to know there are people out there like, like, like you. Um, they're there to help us as we go on our journey with IBM. Um, Rhonda, I see you have your hand up. No, I was applauding because I think this is something. Oh, that is, yes. It, Thank I think and this is something that, that is that, not addressed. So I, I'm just so happy that we're even talking about this subject. Um, I, I hope this is the beginning of many, many more programs and roundtables and discussions and Facebook blogs about what's going on here, because I know that if we don't talk about it and we don't advocate for ourselves, nobody else is. Um, and I can't thank you enough. And I just hope that we will have you guys back at, at some point for other topics. Megan, I know you're extremely busy, but I hope at some point, maybe in the course of six months or whatever, um, we'll be able to... Uh, Twist your arm again. <laughs> it's okay. My arm can take it. I love mental health. It's my passion. Um, myositis is very near and dear to my heart. So um, I'm just excited to connect more with Kelly. Kelly, you're yeah. awesome. No, you. It's thanks, Nancy, for the connections. I think there's so much exciting work going on around the place. But I, I think where our clinicians are pretty well connected, um, I think a lot of this work is being led by occupational therapists and nurses, um, and those of us who maybe get to spend a little bit more time with patients. So it's wonderful to be connected with you guys. We um we love the Hopkins team here. You guys like and, celebrities. And any communicative things. Um, Kelly, that you do, I know with your newsletter that we that we can send out and share to the women, we would appreciate. And Allison and Megan, any things that that you have, um, yeah. uh, that we would love to do that. And um, I, I know that we just need to communicate better and and keep going. It's just um, there's there is so much. Uh, I, I can't. Can I just um, take a moment? I just want to um, emphasize and underline the importance of the difference that you guys can make in research and determining what we do. So we've just here recently finished a study and we're just submitting it for publication, looking at incontinence in inclusion body myositis. Well, in myositis, but um, we had a lot of respondents in inclusion body myositis. And that research program came about because we had a couple of patients who were really telling us it was an issue for them and the literature didn't support it. 
Um, and so we found with our research, an early headline is that um, patients with IBM um, are three, fourfold more likely to suffer from incontinence um, than those in the general community, so age and sex match in the general community. So this is a big issue. And this is an issue that only came about, we're only talking about now, and we talk about it now in clinic more, and we talk about it with our patients more. So mental health is really similar, that if we don't um, take time together and to advocate for the importance of it, we're going to miss it. So don't be afraid to have a voice and to tell your clinicians and your researchers what you want to see done, because that's what we're here for. So that's just my, so we'll share that with you as soon as it's published, because it's really exciting. Um, an amazing medical student who undertook that research. But um, yeah, there's. I just really want to make sure that you all know how important you all are in what we do in IBM and what we learn. And we we can't say how much we appreciate you in any way that that we can share a message to communicate that we can help with what you're doing. I'm sure um, everyone would agree with that we're here do that because the things that you're doing are so important to us um, and it's just it, it, it goes without saying so with that I am looking at the clock and <laughs> I'm gonna with as much as I can clap <laughs> Rhonda help me clap <laughs> ladies let's let's give these three a round of applause and say thank you to everyone. Um, and with that, I'm just going to say, here's the information from Kelly. I, we will send it out on the, the perspective that she said. Um, our next meeting is Thursday, November 21st, as we said. It will be noon Eastern and it's going to be networking as we talked about, talking about managing stress anxiety and a follow up on a lot of the things that we talked about today. December, because of the holidays, we're not going to have a meeting. And January, hopefully, uh, all things considered, we have a couple of people to talk about home modification that we've been trying to get for a long time. I have uh, some healthcare interior designers and uh, a nurse turned interior designer to, to, to come and talk about what we can do to make our homes and our spaces safe. So with that being said, ladies, again, Thank you. Um, as we remember, IBM is generally a slowly progressing disease, and we have time to adapt. Accept our, your condition, exercise with care, keep a positive attitude, and smile. Share your good news. It may just be what someone needs to hear. You are a super warrior. And thank you for the Women with IBM team and all of those who participated and helped. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And or as Kelly is going to say, in the morning. So thank you. And everyone keep in touch. Bye-bye. Nancy, do you need any help closing out the meeting? I think I'm good, Rhonda. I just want to make sure that I get, before I turn off Zoom, I pause and close the...
because sometimes I don't to stop the recording. Bye, Nancy. It was good to see you again. Yeah, you too. And please, hopefully, when you come back in six to eight months, maybe. Of course. Anything for you, Nancy. <laughs> um yeah, no, you know, I, I'm deep I'm I'm deep in it and but this this matters too much to me. So let's let's Allison and and I talk a lot, so let's keep in touch. And, um, you know, I'm going to try to put some notes together, but if there's anything and any information you think needs to be out to everyone and stuff that you guys are doing, we're more than happy to, to forward it to, to our, our women. And we have a mailing list of the women through TMA of over 350 women with IBM. Nancy, did you start this group? You're incredible. I remember being at like conference one day and you were telling me about this idea. Only you can do it, man. You're, <laughs> you're hey, really, you're a powerful lady. <laughs> Thank you. I'm it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a long, hard road, right? Rhonda. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Very but you, you showed your resilience, as they said. So, absolutely. And and Megan, you guys gave me some of the idea, and I twisted a couple of arms. We started with about seven or eight people with this during COVID um, with someone else, and she um, wasn't able to continue after about months or eight months and we just kept going and um you know then we've had people like I, I will never forget I met Kelly on it on a uh, webinar mm -hmm. <laughs> and before you knew it I'm like Kelly don't you want to come help us <laughs> <laughs> No, it's great to be invited. Thank, thanks so much. And, and Megan and Allison, it's so great to hear what you guys are up to there. We're really keen to work together. So um, keep in touch yes. and um, yeah. it'd be great and to catch up and see what we can also, do. Also, my next thing now that we're done is, as I've spoken with Finn and Ruben, they will, um, I need to set something up with you, Kelly, with the, the PT department, because I know that they're interested in in benchmarks and best practices. Yeah, I mean we have we have one physio, so our department's one person, but that's all good. <laughs> he's he's right. um he's, he's you know um enough of an enigma to be a whole department. So that's good. <laughs> right. all right. I better yeah. I better leave you guys, but thank you so much um for the opportunity to join you. Oh no, really thank thank you. I just don't need to know how. Oh, I just figured out. Yes. I'm